Good evening. It is so wonderful to see you all here. Um, and it's a, an esteemed collection, this particular audience, uh, uh, on a for reasons we will get to at the topic of the night. Welcome to Rouser College's Horace M. Albright Lecture in Conservation in Collaboration with the Essex Museum of Entomology Research. I'm David Ackerley, Dean of Rouser College of Natural Resources. I'm joined by my colleague, Pete Obojski, who is right in front of me. That's why I can't see him. Um, Executive Director and Collections Manager at the ESSIG. And it is our pleasure, pleasure to welcome our esteemed guest, Oliver Millman, to UC Berkeley. Before we welcome Oliver to the stage, I'd like to share a bit of background on these lectures. The Horace Albright Lecture Series at the Rouser College of Natural Resources has been going strong for over 50 years. And you'd think I'd have the rest of this memorized by now. Uh, it's good to do this once or twice a year. The lectures are a tribute to the achievements of Horace Albright, born in Bishop, California in 1890, a graduate of UC Berkeley in 1912, second director of the National Park Service, and a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom bestowed by Jimmy Carter. We're honored to have the opportunity to use the Horace Albright Endowed Lecture Series for the public good, fostering a dialogue on the critical issues facing our society. The Albright Lecture Series has brought to Berkeley a who's who of the world's most thought-provoking and innovative leaders in conservation and public service. I encourage you to check out our website to see the great list of speakers and recordings of recent talks. And I would also like to note on that, on that note, a welcome to all of those who in the future or now uh, listen to this online. Uh, Post-COVID, as we've recorded and streamed things, we've, we're finding that many more people even who come live subsequently watch these talks and it's just become a wonderful resource. So in that context, when we saw this book, it was clear who we were going to invite for an all bite lecture because, as you all know, I don't have to tell this audience, Berkeley is a special place for entomology. And um, while the subject is sobering, as we will get into, it's a topic of such great interest to the audience. It was a no-brainer on a topic that we wanted to use as an opportunity to bring our speaker, collaborate with the ESSIG, um, and host this talk. Um, we will have live questions after the talk. But before we get to that, I'd like to welcome Pete Obojski to tell you more about the ESSIG. Uh, Pete received his PhD in insect biology from UC Berkeley, and as I said, is now the director and the collections manager at the ESSIG Museum. So Pete. Thank you, David. Oh, no. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the ESSIG Museum, welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're all able to make it. And I suspect that you know, most of you already have some notion that insects play an outsized role in our ecosystems, and so you're, you're somewhat self-selected as a crowd. Uh, if you're not, actually, I'd be interested to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> but you know, years ago, you, you probably heard about colony collapse with, with honeybees and you know, the insect apocalypse and you know, stories of uh, you know, the sixth extinction. And it was becoming a water cooler issue. People were talking about it. It was kind of a common conversation people were having about you know, the insect crisis. And then this, this COVID thing hit. And people had other things to worry about. And, and so you know, their, their attention got distracted. And so I was, I was really happy to see Oliver's book come out because it brought back to the, to the front line the, the interest in, in this problem of insects declining. And it got people talking about it again. So I think just for that reason alone, it's, it's fantastic to have this book out here. Of course, it's a fantastic book and, and worth the read anyway. Um, now, one of the things you'll hear about is, is you know, this, this challenge of long-term data sets to show this kind of decline. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's a problem. There's a few well-known studies out there that you'll hear about. Um, but, but in California, we, we don't necessarily have that readily available to talk about. Well, that's where the Essex Museum comes in. So the Essex Museum, a lot of people don't realize we have this in insect collection right there on the Berkeley campus, 5 million specimens, over 50,000 species of insects, mostly North America, Western uh, North America, especially California. And they range 120 years of research at California. So what does that mean? Over 120 years of collecting insects, we've had droughts, fires, floods, urbanization, the spread of agriculture, what impact has that had on the plants and animals of this state? Well, unless you have a time machine, you can go back and, and see what was there. You know, the next place to go is to a natural history museum. Those are the time capsules of what was here before. So we've been working on digitizing all of our 5 million specimens in the collection. Some of the students working on that are here, are here today. Thank you to all of you. 
Um, and so, you know, those data are going online along with high resolution photographs of each of these species so that these are freely available to the public to look at some of these kinds of trends that we've been seeing over time. So that's really the role that the, the Insect Museum has been playing for the past. So that's up from the past up to the, the present. But you know, you think of museums, and, and my brother thinks that I walk around with a feather duster dusting things off. No, 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 we're, we're an active collection. We're growing, we're, we're doing things. And so we, we currently have people out doing field collections, doing biodiversity surveys across the state. And we have new tools um, looking at DNA and doing DNA sequencing of some of these insects so that in the future we have rapid identification resources. So this is a very active area of research on the UC Berkeley campus. And of course, you know, you, as you suspect, a lot of these things are funded by uh, grants that they're competitive grants we, we apply for. Um, but the, the core of our facility is really comes from, um, you know, dwindling funds from the campus. So we're always looking for sponsors. I just have to throw that out there as, you know, my obligation, you know, standing up here to represent that. Um, uh, but really, you know, the essence of the Essig Museum is, is documenting the past and protecting the future. And I think that that really fits well with what Oliver's going to talk about tonight. So I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to have this talk tonight. And uh, I'm happy to talk to folks afterwards about the museum if you don't know much about it. But I'm going to turn it back over to David to do our, our final introduction. So enjoy the show. Thank you, Pete. As dean, it's always nice to have someone else asking for support. Um, uh, and now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Oliver Millman. Oliver is a journalist and author originally from the UK who has written on environmental issues for The Guardian for the past decade, both in Australia and more recently in the United States. Oliver has extensively covered the climate emergency, documenting its impact upon the Arctic, the Great Barrier Reef, the Everglades, and numerous other places and communities, as well as the broader ecological depredations affecting wildlife and our shared world. Oliver used this experience to write his first book, The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires That Run the World. After being struck by research showing startling declines of insects in several places around the world, the book published in the US last year is one of the first to examine what is driving the collapse of insects and why this is perhaps the most significant loss in the animal world since the dinosaurs were wiped out. It has received widespread praise from the environmentalist Bill McKibben to the New York Times and Me Too. And before the evening is out, I will get my copy signed. So welcome, Oliver Milman. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm a little bit shorter than you, David, so I'm just going to put that down there. Um, thank you so much, David. Uh, thank you so much, um, Peter. Thank you so much uh, for Cassie as well, Cassie Darling, for helping to organize this and giving me the opportunity today to speak uh, to you um, about what many of us know as bugs, but all the entomologists here will know uh, more accurately called insects. Uh, there are only some true bugs, of course. Um, and so thank you, thank you very much for this. Um, I don't have any slides or any kind of visuals uh, and I'm also talking about a book that was described in one of the first uh, reviews of it on Goodreads in a single word in block capitals, Grim. So sorry <laughs> for the downbeat, um, uh, downbeat topic here, but hopefully we'll get through this and endure this together. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to firstly um, take you back. Uh, we were talking about insect declines, but I wanted to kind of go back through the mists of time, 400 and 10 million years ago to the Paleozoic period, a time before dinosaurs, and the world looks radically different to now. It's around this time that we see the first insects as we know them today, the first earliest known insect specimens found pancaked in some sandstone in, in Scotland, in fact. Um, they, they have a slow start to life on Earth, but insects are the first, among the first animals that take flight among the first to, to be able to digest plants. And they're pioneers in developing camouflage to, to avoid predators. Um, they're also, in some cases, absolutely enormous. There was a, I learned there was a, there was a gargantuan dragonfly-like creature called Meganura that lived in the swamp forest of what is now Illinois. It had a wingspan of 28 inches, which is the same, I'm told, as a mallard duck, if you could imagine such a thing. That gives a hint to the broad array, the stunning kaleidoscopic diversity of insect life that we see today. We don't quite see mallard ducks like uh, uh, dragonflies, but we certainly see uh, a collection of animals unrivaled 
uh, in, 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 in diversity, in colour, um, and in abilities too. Um, in their weird and wonderful forms, they've really uh, enlivened and enriched our world. One entomologist said to me, they're a bit like aliens on Earth because they look so kind of strange, but in, in, in the kind of the purest sense, they are make what makes Earth, Earth. They've made Earth what it is today. Um, if you spool through geologic time, you see that insects are the world's great survivors. They, they tenaciously hang on as five mass extinctions wipe out life, including the dinosaurs. They develop this intricate dance with plants, which you could say is the most successful relationship there's ever been on Earth. Um, scientists recently cracked open some, this is quite recent, uh, cracked open some rocks in Russia and found these earwig-like insects that were kind of encased in sediment. And they lived uh, an estimated 280 million years ago and they, they had clumps of pollen on their bodies, making them perhaps the world's first pollinators about 100 million years prior to when we first thought po pollinators came along, um, predating the dinosaurs, predating the dinosaurs insects or pollinating plants. It's quite an incredible thing to think about. Um, they became the catalyst for the terrestrial world, propagating almost everything that blossoms and becomes food. They replenish the soils, they decompose the waste, they become intrinsic to life here. So even before we started shredding their world, um, <laughs> insects left their imprint on our, our own human history. During the American Revolution, the British Army was so ravaged by malaria that its sudden Commander Lord Cornwallis uh, sought to withdraw to the north uh, to avoid what, she, what he called the fatal sickness, which so nearly ruined the army. Instead, he was ordered to hold Yorktown, where his depleted forces were overcome by American and French troops, pr prompting the end of the war, which is very, very painful for me to talk about. But they, um, as a result of this military collapse, the historian Timothy Weingard has called the common marsh mosquito the founding mother of the United States. So there you have it. You have George Washington, you have Alexander Hamilton, and you have the marsh mosquito. Um, jump forward another 100 years, and the invention of the modern beehive box for honeybees in the town of Oxford, Ohio, transforms agriculture as we know it. Previously, if farmers had a, a large plot of land, they couldn't possibly harvest a, uh, vegetables and fruit across it because there simply wasn't the pollinators uh, to do that. Now you have these mobile boxes of indentured bee helpers um, uh, helping landowners to pollinate sprawling tracts of land which paved the way to the industrialized high production streamlined system now overseen by large agricultural corporation that's gobbled up so much of the planet. Uh, that system is also very destructive but we will get to that, don't worry, the grim part is, is coming, um, everybody. And then, in the 1940s, can anybody guess what the first animal in space is? Is it a dog? Is it a cat? Is it a monkey? No, it's not. It's the humble fruit fly propelled into the atmosphere in US military rocket in 1947 to ascertain the potential impact of cosmic radiation on astronauts. Um, that uh, fruit fly did not get a statue or a name. <laughs> It has not got its place in history, and yet we here today remember its sacrifice and its work in uh, pioneering scientific endeavor. Insects, it feels, are everywhere. Three out of every four known species on Earth are insects. The number of fly species is at least four times larger than all the different types of fish there are in the ocean. The assassin fly, a creature which spends its time, I'm delighted to tell you, sucking out the internal organs of other prey insects. There's more than 7,000 types of assassin fly, which is more than all the types of mammal in the world, all the types of whale, monkey, dog, bear. I could talk about mammals, but you know what mammals are. They possess incredible abilities too. Um, some ants act as paramedics to other ants, I found out through the writing of this book. Um, one type of water beetle called the Japanese water scavenger beetle uh, can survive being eaten by a frog by swimming through the frog's stomach and crawling after his bottom. Paper wasps can recognize other wasps by looking at their faces. Bees, I would contend, are one of the most remarkable creatures on earth. They can fly as high as Mount Kilimanjaro is tall and perform feats of logistics no human could possibly hope to recreate. Despite having the brain the size of a poppy seed, uh, bees have a 
an amazing mental acuity. Uh, they can learn from their negative experiences. It's been found that they, when they show signs of trauma in a, in a frightening situation, levels of dopamine and serotonin increase or drop depending on, uh, depending on the experiences they're going through. If they get a sweet treat, their levels rise a bit like humans do when we get ice cream or something. And they, and they drop when they face danger. Uh, bees can understand the concept of zero. They can add and subtract numbers. They can even be trained to detect landmines better than sniffer dogs. Um, you can teach a bumblebee to play soccer. And then if you, if you followed it to its hive afterwards, after it's warmed down and like got changed, it will go back to its hive. And bees are so altruistic that they will give up sleep to care for the hive's young. Um, all of this points to what many people would consider to be a form of consciousness in bees. Um, certainly not the consciousness that we would consider to be human, but certainly a far way from uh, the idea that we were maybe previously had of bees as being these brainless, buzzing automatons, um, the, these kind of uh, empty vessels that, that just fly around and, and have no inner life. Um, I think they're better than that, and I think we're better than that to think of them uh, in that way. So it can seem impossible, given that history, given those, those incredible abilities, that insects could be in any sort of existential danger. Um, and all, given that history and also our day-to-day our -day interactions with them, they're perhaps the closest animals to us in our day-to-day -day lives, aren't they? Other, other than our dogs and cats, perhaps. And most of the, those encounter, encounters can seem unpleasant. You know, the bite, the sting, the, the ants kind of marching through the pantry. Um, when I was writing the book, ants actually invaded my, my kitchen, which seemed appropriate and, uh, and, and, and lovely at the same time. Um, they, seemed, they seemed to be everywhere uh, uh, all at once. Um, and yet, as I outline in my book, The Insect Crisis, their insects are suffering a sort of silent catastrophe. They're disappearing from environment at an alarming rate in places around the world. This is where it gets grim. We may be witnessing the most consequential extinction event in Earth's history since the dinosaurs, and it isn't based around elephants or polar bears or orangutans. It's based around what E.O. Wilson famously called the little things that run the world. So what do we know <clears throat> about this crisis? The picture is far from complete. We don't know much about what's going on in the tropics, for example, that great trove of insect life. Um, so the picture is not entirely complete. Uh, but the evidence we have from elsewhere so far has been pretty horrifying. Uh, it previously seemed, as many of the scientists here would know, fairly pointless to count insects. I mean, why would you? I mean, they, they seem to be everywhere. You'd far rather be documenting new species and their incredible behaviors rather than counting them. Uh, but the whole host of studies started coming out around from around 2017, 2018, that laid bare the sheer magnitude of this insect crisis. We finally started keeping score in the game, and we found out that insects, as well as us, were losing quite badly indeed. Uh, so alarm was first stirred, it would be fair to say, by this landmark piece of research in 2017 that analysed the contents of, of insect traps in 63 protected um, areas across Germany. Uh, it showed that the annual average weight of flying insects had slumped by 76% since 1989. Uh, the situation in the height of summer, when insects obviously at their, at their apex, was even worse. They were down 82%. Somehow, in protected areas in the advanced civilization of Germany, uh, lost three quarters of their flying insect life um, in the time since the Berlin Wall fell, which is, is quite astonishing. It made... It made many people think, well, if this is happening in Germany, what's happening elsewhere? And unfortunately, we were to find out um, what was happening elsewhere, half a world away. An Amer American entomologist called Brad Lister, he lives and works in upstate New York. He visited the El Yunque rainforest in Puerto Rico. It's the only rainforest on US soil. Uh, he, he went back a couple of years ago to recreate a survey he did in the 1970s where he placed plates with sticky substances on the forest floor and in the canopy. Uh, in the 70s, he'd go down in the, he'd go and check the plates in the morning and they were matted black with insects. He just, they were, you know, teeming with thousands and thousands and thousands of insects. But in his return a few years ago, he recreated this study and he was amazed to find barely any insects on these plates. 
in this seemingly pristine wilderness. It's not been an area that's been developed through agricultural or urban uh, expansion or anything like that. Um, and he ran the numbers uh, and they were quite amazing. On the ground, 98% of insects by biomass are gone. In the leafy canopy, 80% have disappeared. Uh, Lister told me he found the declines to be absolutely astonishing. Um, as you'll know, and as um, uh, Pete alluded to, the, the media la has latched onto this worry and we've been introduced to terms like insectageddon, insect apocalypse, variations of the above, just mash words together that, that sound terrifying. Um, and I know several entomologists, when I spoke to them, were initially quite skeptical about this. I mean, this idea that things were generally seen to be okay and now the world's caving in um, is, is something that scientists treat skeptically, um, as you'll know. Uh, but I know several of them started to dig around in their own dusty notes for any insect population numbers um, and many of them were disturbed with what they found. So what did they find? We've learned in just the couple, last couple of years that the Netherlands has lost more than 80% of its butterflies since the 19th century. In Britain, butterfly numbers have halved since the last, in the last 50 years and the abundance of flying insects overall has plummeted by nearly 60% just since 2004. I spoke to one rather eccentric scientist in Denmark who has spent every summer day since 1997 driving up and down the same stretch of country ro road in his old, old kind of beat up Ford Anglia car and then counting the number of bugs splattered on his windshield. Surprise, surprise, they've become rarer. Uh, an incredible 97% decrease in the time he's been doing this, this survey. Um, this rather unusual experiment captures what's known as the windshield effect, which has become a kind of easy to grasp shorthand for, for those of us who remember being in a car when we were younger, driving cross country and maybe having to stop and scrape bugs off the, off the windshield. Um, that's becoming a much, much rarer event. I, I remember being in Montana recently, obviously a sparsely kind of populated state, and driving around for a whole week, not a single insect on my, on my windshield. I think more and more of us are noticing us. It's become a symbol of the insect crisis and much like how the very forlorn looking polar bear on a shrinking piece of ice has become the kind of visual embodiment of the, of the climate crisis. That can lead us down several kind of different psychological avenues, some of which I explored in the book, such as uh, shifting baseline syndrome, where we, what we perceive as normal in the world changes, the world changes. The most famous example of this is the study of pictures of people catching fish off, off the Florida, Florida Keys, which I, um, which I explained a bit in the book, but essentially over the decades, decades, the fish have got smaller, the catch has got smaller as coral reefs have dis disappeared, um, pollution, uh, climate change and so on. And so in the 1950s, you'd have pictures of people, uh, 1950s, you'd have pictures of people holding fish as large as they are, uh, and now it's kind of fish the size of your hand, perhaps, and yet the smiles on people's faces remain. To them, it is normal. It is normal to catch now a fish that size because you do not remember what ha happened in the 1950s. We risk the same fading memory of insect abundance as they disappear like the fish have disappeared off the coast of Florida. Anyway, on with the declines. I could go on and on. In North America, one in four, four bumblebee species is in decline and threatened with extinction. Globally, a quarter of all known bee species haven't had a confirmed sighting since the 1990s, which is an astonishing fact that suggests, uh, I don't think it means that a quarter of bee species have been lost, but certainly um, uh, plenty of them seem to have. Uh, we don't know the full story from around the world, as I was saying before. We don't even know how many total insect species they are because you know, it's almost impossible job to count them all. There could be five, 10, five million, 10 million. Some estimates even put it as high as 30 million. But uh, scientists are increasingly confident and gloomily saying there are widespread declines going on that threaten profound consequences for us all. The United Nations estimates half a million insect species could become extinct by the midpoint of this century. According to one study, which was, was very hotly debated in the scientific world, Insect populations are dropping worldwide on average by about one to two percent a year. So why does this all matter? It's a pertinent question because it can be hard to muster any sort of warm feelings towards insects. We disparage them as creepy crawlies. We say that irritating people are bugging us. Uh, when filmmakers wanted to turn Jeff Goldblum into a revolting creature, 
the understandably chose to turn him into a fly rather than a, a golden retriever or something. <laughs> uh, we are culturally, perhaps fatally, predisposed to either disliking insects or finding them pointless. Personally, if someone told me five years ago that my first book would be on insects, I probably would have laughed at them. Uh, as an environmental writer, I was drawn to doing the big flashy things on the beach, which involves going diving on the Great Barrier Reef or going on a boat on the Everglades or looking for grizzly bears in, uh, in, in Montana. Um, you don't immediately dream in this role of digging through drawers of dead bugs with um, bearded men wearing sandals in St. Louis, as I did end up doing. <laughs> but what a revelation it has been and what a joy it's been. And I've met some wonderful people while doing it. Entomologists are just um, the best people. And it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride. So only when this cavalcade of studies on insect declines arrived, and when I started talking to scientists about what was at stake here, that I realized this was probably the greatest and yet quietest disaster unfolding in the natural world, perhaps even rivaling the climate crisis itself. So why does it matter? Why, why is it a disaster? It matters for a, a number of profound reasons, um, starting with what a lot of us think about a lot of our time, which are our stomachs. Um, most famously, insects pollinate around a third of the food we eat, everything from almonds to melons to broccoli to, I mean, cranberries, the list, list goes on and on and on. Their, list, their loss is already being felt. There's, there's been research showing that crop yields of apples, cherries and blueberries are falling in parts of the US and Canada due to a lack of pollinators. In areas of China, there are teams of people being sent out into orchards with sticks with brushes on the end to hand pollinate the orchards because they are bereft of bees. Um, insects aren't around just to fill up plates though. They perform a lot of the unglamorous but crucial work that keeps the world ticking over, such as breaking down feces and dead bodies. One researcher, the incomparable Erica McAllister from the Natural History Museum in London, told me that without insects, we'd be living in a world of poo with dead Uncle Jeremy floating on past us, which is a horrifying image. And they also, essential in cycling nutrients through soils and plants. Uh, they also food themselves, of course, to both animals and human cultures. You yank away insects and you disrupt an entire food web that relies upon them. Ecosystems start to falter, then collapse. Indeed, in a growing list of studies, we're finding that birds that dine mostly on insects, such as warblers, swallows, and bluebirds, are suffering deeper population drops than omnivores, such as crows. Uh, and starlings, a telling, it's a telling fingerprint of insect decline is what's happening in the bird world. In just a recent 10 year period, an estimated 12.7 million pairs of breeding birds disappear from Germany, which is about 15% of its entire avian population. In 2018, it was reported that bird populations across the French countryside have slumped by more than a third since the turn of the millennium. So almost every indicator of human and planetary health depends at least in part on insects, a whole edifice of life rests upon their tiny, slender little shoulders. Uh, their loss is already cutting deep. Recent research found that the loss of pollinators is already causing around half a million deaths around the world each year due to a lack of available healthy food. Uh, certain foods could become more expensive in rich countries such as the US. Well, in poorer developing countries, they may not become, be available at all with disastrous implications. We may be even missing out on potential new medicines. Bee venom has been found to be a possible weapon against certain cancers, while honey is thought to have uh, properties useful in combating heart disease and skin problems. Insects are an incredible resource uh, in a selfish, human-centric point of view in terms of food and medicine as well as their cultural importance. Um, we'll, we risk losing a great deal. It's, it's not just the essentials of life we risk losing, it's the joys too. The world's, the world, the things that make life worth living. I mean, the world's entire production of chocolate, for example, is dependent on a tiny midge that can fall, fly into the cacao plant and pollinate it. Uh, production of ice cream hinges on insects that can pollinate alfalfa, which is then eaten by the cows. Uh, without bees, there is no coffee. There is little in the natural world, I, th I feel, that matches the flash and brilliance of a firefly or the, the beat of a beautiful butterfly's wings. So if you like birds and chocolate and ice cream and fruit and vegetables <laughs> and beauty and not dying a horrible malnourished death surrounded <laughs> by crap and dead bodies, then you should really want insects around.
They really do incredible things for us all and all other uh, living creatures on earth. They pretty much prop up the edifice of life on this planet and how have we rewarded them for this? We've wiped out large numbers of them, uh, making the rest of them deranged or miserable uh, while being rude about them as we do it by calling them creepy crawlies and bugs. We pour our affection and our conservation dollars into, upon big beasts, the charismatic megafauna, what a terrible term that is, uh, like rhinos that play very little role in human welfare from a selfish point of view. While we roll our eyes at insects, which we'd all perish without in a matter of months if they were all to disappear. It's a very imbalanced and very strange set of priorities we have. Why is this happening? Uh, there are three main things that scientists blame for the decline of insects. There are other factors too, but I'll just go through the big three. So habitat loss. We've cut down about a third of all trees that were on this planet at the start of the industrial era. We have uh, transformed what were previously complex forests and grasslands and wild meadows into featureless monocultural farmlands, cities, highways, and industrial areas. This has been disastrous for many animals, but particularly insects. Secondly, there is pesticide use. Not only have we taken away a diverse range of food and shelter from insects, we've also decided to literally poison them in what remains. The inse insecticides we used liberally across croplands kill pests and that, such as aphids, but wipe out everything else too. Bees, butterflies, beetles, the stuff we don't want to kill. By one estimate, America's agricultural land is 48 times more toxic than it was 25 years ago. There's even very good evidence that the indiscriminate use of chemicals doesn't even improve crop yields. We're riddling our land with poison for little benefit other than to enrich a handful of large agricultural corporations. I certainly don't blame individual farmers for this. They've been sold um, solutions that have proved to be detrimental to the natural world uh, with questionable results for them in terms of what they're growing. The third big thing is, uh, you might have guessed, is climate change. Uh, previously, uh, scientists thought the insects might fare a little better than other creatures uh, in the teeth of the climate crisis. This has turned out to not be the case, according to recent research. Insects survive in fairly narrow band of temperatures. Unless you're a dragonfly or some other, uh, other small group of insects, you can't really travel that far um, to, to, a, to, to move to a, a climate that's more um, uh, hospitable to you. Uh, so we cramped up, cranked up the temperature, and we've also thrown the seasons off kilter, this kind of intricate dance between um, uh, flowers uh, blooming, insects arriving, birds, uh, that whole interplay has been th thrown off. In some parts of the US, spring is arriving 20 days earlier than it did a, a century or so ago. Uh, it's been, that's been catastrophic for insects. And uh, of course, uh, as we're not getting our act together on the climate crisis, that will get worse. Um, the threats may be many and varied then, but there is a unifying cultural driver to this war on insects, I would argue. We associate them with disease, and death and irritation. Some of that is justified if you consider the huge toll from disease carrying mosquitoes, for example. Two million people a year dead is a very good reason in certain parts of the world to be wary of mosquitoes, especially given their range is expanding as the world heats up. But it is deeper than that. We actively teach children to dislike insects. If you speak to entomologists who work with schools, they'll tell you that kinders, gardeners love insects. I think they're cool, really interesting. They love them. By the time they're in high school, they, they will hate them. They will think that they're weird and a bit gross. We're passing down this inherited, learned dislike of the creatures that literally keep us alive. It's again, a very strange dichotomy that we, we see there. The way we live and see the world also is, is the polar opposite to insects' well-being. We, we value generally speaking here, tidiness and order, everything in its right place. We call plants that we consider to be in the wrong place to be weeds, which is a very subjective term. They are um, food and shelter for insects, um, but we get rid of them. We fetishize the growing and keeping of vast manicured lawns, which have become a kind of symbol of the suburban American dream, but in fact a wasteland for insects. Um, one of the most startling facts I found out while writing this book, is that lawns are the largest irrigated crop in America. It's about three times the size of the area given over to corn. Uh, the second strangest thing, I think, 
I was talking to people who really love mosquitoes. They're, there's only a really small group of them, and I think I spoke to them all for the book. <laughs> One of these genet geneticists, she was spent 20 years trying to find ways to wipe out all mosquitoes through genetic engineering, and until one day she looked at a mosquito underneath a microscope and saw its eyes and its wings and thought, wow, it's beautiful. And she had this amazing epiphany. She's still trying to kill them, but through different ways. <laughs> um, the third weirdest thing was finding out that the central valley, of, <laughs> central valley of California, which many of you will know very well, there are bee brokers, people who match up farmers and beekeepers for the increasingly scarce pollination services. This job is so lucrative, the bee broker I spoke to in the Central Valley, she only has to work two months a year. She plays golf the rest of the year. It's, it's quite incredible. It's because pollination is, resources have become so stretched um, and so valuable that that job is now highly sought after. Uh, there are also bee rustlers in the Central Valley who steal beehives off the back of trucks because the pollination is so valuable. And I managed to speak to Central Valley's very own bee detective, who's not a bee, he's a human, but he, um, <laughs> he investigates bee thefts. Again, another sign that pollination has become overstretched uh, and it shows the dependence the farming system has upon managed honeybee hives. Anyway, we, so we have large featureless lawns and we have large featureless fields uh, of just single crops, such as koi and so on, that a uh, koi or Oh, soy or oh, corn. <laughs> it's mixing up some letters there, just trying them out for a change. These areas have no life in them for insects. They're essentially deserts. We created desert landscapes for insects all over the place. One expert told me it's like all you have to eat is chips. Nothing but chips. Even if you're allergic to chips, don't like chips, too bad. All you've got is chips. Um, we stamped out the scruffy disorder. Uh, the wild tangle of different plants and varied hab habitats that insects thrive in. And of course, the natural world has responded in kind. The natural world does not care if there are lions or cockroaches. It will simply react to change. And we're creating a planet that's far more hospitable to mosquitoes and cockroaches and rats than it is to bumblebees and butterflies. So we, we are writing um, our, our own decline in with our choices here. When you go to a place that hasn't been manicured to death, uh, it's starting to see what you see what's been lost what the norm was before we started doing this. You walk through wildflowers and grasses that reach to your knee and the insects are bouncing off you. Everything's kind of humming and, um, you know, there's, there's insects everywhere. It's a kind of humming or a kind of oasis of life. It's what it should be. We sanitize our surroundings to such extent that we've made the world quite boring, in fact. Um, and this, I feel, is the key to solving the insect crisis. We need big policy changes on pesticide use and farming practices, and we can see the contours already of what that would look like. If you look at the European Union, they've led the way on incentivizing farmers to put wildlife corridors um, through their fields, running along the edges of their fields so that insects can move and breed, rather than leaving nothing there at the edges. Um, uh, they're also mindful and become aware that insects do more harm than good to their crops because they can kill a lot of the negative um, uh, insects that, that will eat their crops. They've also, the EU, banned some of the worst types of neonicotinoids, which are these indiscriminately devastating chemicals used um, uh, and are still legal in the US. Uh, they're called neonics for short. They're water soluble. Many will know this, but they, that means that they seep quite easily into soils and waterways and they spread all over the place. They've been found in everything from onions to people's urine to baby food. Uh, they've even been, they've been blamed for killing off birds as well as, as, well as bees. They've been fairly disastrous. Um, but we've seen that there is a response to this. There is now uh, the shape of uh, a, a, a better way of doing things. If you look at Bavaria, the conservative farming heartland of Germany, a couple of years ago, they had a public referendum on whether should they have organic farming, bring back hedgerows, get rid of chemicals. Resoundingly, the answer was yes. People wanted this. People want insects back in their lives. People want bees back. We're seeing countries push forward with renewable energy projects to tackle the climate crisis and mobilize dollars to protect the few intact ecosystems we have less. There's encouraging localized action, which I saw through the writing of this book. Um, communities across the US planting milkweed for uh, monarch butterflies, for example, or 
cities from Detroit in the US to Utrecht in, um, in the Netherlands, giving over derelict areas of cities to small wild areas, um, little mini meadows. Even on the tops of bus shelters in the Netherlands, you'll find these little green areas where bees can live. Um, I was lucky enough to see a green roof project in New York City where grasses and wildflowers have been allowed to flourish on top of a, um, a building in a, a very heavily industrialized area, like a big kind of shock of green haircut for this, this particular building. It was amazing. You, you stand amongst this greenery and all these insects and this life and it's in the middle of summer when um, it's blazing hot, but it's cooler there because of the cooling of the effect of the vegetation. And you look around all the other concrete, all the roofs, and you think, why is it not like this? everywhere else and New York and some other states have been starting to pass some laws to, to try and force developers to consider that. So there is a way forward. We can see the outlines of it. We can grasp it. But helping insects is also about what we don't do. One entomologist um, uh, put it to me, we need more of an inaction plan rather than an action plan. We just need to let go a bit, let things slide. Um, we saw it during the pandemic and there were many stories at the start of the pandemic, weren't there, about wildlife taking over city centres, kind of dolphins and wild boar and whatever it may be. But also you saw local authorities stopping cutting the grass next to highways. And what happens when you do that? You start getting the grasses and the plants coming back and you get the insects coming back and then you get the birds coming back and suddenly you have little urban oases of, of life where there wasn't there before. Um, People can do this at home as well. There's, there's much you can do at home. It's not beyond our control. You can mow the lawn a little less. Don't rake the leaves as often. Don't put chemicals all over your property. A little laziness can go a long way here. <laughs> Insects are the great survivors. After all, we just need to give them a chance if we are just lazy, but also do some other things. <laughs> um, Insects deserve their place in the world beyond their our own needs, of course. They have their own intrinsic value. They're not just here to serve us. I was lucky enough to go to central Mexico just before the pandemic hit to see the annual arrival of the monarch butterfly migration that comes down from the US and Canada over winter in central Mexico. It's truly one of the, the truly incredible spectacles in, in, of nature and I encourage anyone to see it who's not seen it. I took a horse up the mountains um, it was more like Switzerland than Mexico, it felt like. Um, it's a very alpine area. And saw these groves of fir trees uh, where there were so many butterflies, millions of them, that the, the branches sagged under their weight. Sometimes the branches would snap, there were so many butterflies. It was an incredible sight. When they all roused themselves to fly at once, it was this huge orange and black wave. It was like a kind of waking dream. It was a transcendent moment, something I won't ever forget. And it's, it's a kind of sign, I think, that we are losing beauty as well as utility uh, when we talk about insect declines. It's not just pollination services and all that kind of thing. It's, it's that indescribable beauty too. Um, the mass migration of monarch butterflies, as, as many of you will know, is diminished from once it once was. Millions used to come to California. Now you can measure that number in thousands. Um, it will end within a few decades in Mexico. Uh, due to climate change, which threatens the trees that the, the, the butterflies roost upon. So essentially, the trees cannot outpace the temperature change. They cannot climb up the mountain quick enough to outpace how hot it's getting. Uh, and without the trees, the butterflies will also go. It's, a, it's an incredibly sad tale, but it's a kind of sign, I think, of something we would want to keep. It's something tangible you can look at and say, this is a spectacle you'd want to hold on to uh, as tightly as you possibly can. Um, so dealing with the insect crisis will take a lot of different actions, both big and small, to turn things around. It won't necessarily be easy and often involve some difficult choices, uh, but unfortunately we don't have another option. Uh, we need them far more than they need us, and it's time we started acting like it. Uh, I just wanted to kind of round this off by talking a bit about my trip to the Smithsonian um, Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. Uh, if you've never been to see the marvelous collection of uh, insects there, I'd recommend you do so. I had a good chat with the curator there, a man called Floyd Shockley, about the, uh, about the more outlandish ideas to overcome all this destruction. Um, there's proposals to, and work in debt, in fact, going on in Harvard and some other places to create an army of robot bees. So you would just send those out in their millions to to replace real bees. Um, and also, if it's appropriate, 
to say, given I'm in Elon Musk's backyard at the moment, we could all relocate to Mars. That's another idea of how to deal with this. Um, so I just wanted to read to you a passage of what Floyd said about this. And as, as a context, I've mentioned we were standing next to a giant mounted elephant in the uh, museum. Um, if you put dreams of robot B replacements on steroids, you arrive at the sci-fi thinking embraced as realistic escape pod by some of humankind relocating entirely from a trashed Earth to Mars or some other planets, terraforming its barren rock face into a new technological utopia, free of wars and pollution and stupidity. Shockley can imagine conversations about such far-fetched strategy taking place within the nearby halls of the US government, but cannot envision, even in this extreme space age fantasy, that we would be able to cut our ties of dependence with insects. Obviously, any way we want to grow food, we'll probably need bees, Floyd says, as tourists take selfies underneath the elephant. We may well be the first invasive species to colonize another planet but bees will be number two. We should do all we can to save insects because ultimately in doing so, we will save ourselves, whether that's on Earth or on Mars. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Oliver. Um, you may be double mic'd. Is this working as well? Can people hear? Just do a quick test. Can you hear me? Hello? Um, sort of. So why don't we do this? I'll take this spot. You're welcome to also take this stool if you'd okay. like. Because we're going to take some Q&A. I just want you to be comfortable. Um, so um, I will open with the first question. Um, so uh, you have a sympathetic audience, I think it's fair to say, here. Uh, I'm also <laughs> we'll going to hazard a guess that every single person in this audience, no matter how much they knew, learned something, either from your talk or the book. And uh, because I know, um, you know, as a working scientist, we, we're expected to be experts, and yet we're all even in that realm, in our lane, and don't get to read so broadly and so expensively, and it's one of the joys of reading wonderful journalism. Okay, so how about other audiences? What, have you gotten into those audiences that, are, that aren't the experts? And I'm really curious about the reaction. What kind of, what's the, what's the sort of range of reactions you've had when you've been speaking about the book? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I think there has been a, a really great and kind of encouraging response, I think, from the public. I think there is a kind of stirring understanding that something is amiss. You kind of hear kind of, uh, as you'll know, I'm sure you, 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 you had to navigate a scientist anecdote. <laughs> um, and there's lots of anecdote out there. It's an anecdote of, oh, I used to see butterflies down here. Now I don't. I used to um, you know, sit out on my back uh, on, on the porch and there would be, you know, um, uh, you know, moths or whatever circling the light and there aren't anymore. Um, so you hear a lot of anecdote. You kind of see that recognition. Um, but also there is still that kind of inherent hostility. I, think I spoke to some people about this before, but you do some radio phone-ins. I've done some radio phone-ins from a number of um, states, talk about radio, and a lot of it is still, okay, but how do I get rid of termites? Uh, um, I, don't like, I don't like ants. Uh, how do I get rid of them? So there is still a kind of certain hostility towards insects, seeing them as a problem rather than, um, the, the beneficial things that they are. But I think there is certainly, certainly among people of a certain age and above a, a sense of loss, you know, a nostalgia almost. Well, looking in the audience, it's good to see Bernard's not here because our, the godfather of California termite control is, in, in <laughs> fact, <laughs> yeah, Berkeley uh, um, emeritus. <laughs> and it's too bad Bernard's not here, of course. Um, all right. <laughs> oh, oh he'll, good. You'll see him tomorrow. Good. No, you will enjoy that very much. Um, I want to open it up. So please, the one thing to ask is that you wait for a microphone to arrive because we are recording so that people can hear the questions. Bob and Linda, right here. Bob's right here. I was hoping you could comment on the reproduction capability of insects. So if you do give them a good space, how quickly do they come back? Yeah. Well, as all of you will know, that you look at any kind of graph of insect numbers, it's kind of like this, right? I mean, they, they reproduce in such huge numbers. Um, they can have good years and bad years. And I think that's been one of the challenges to finding out what the long-term trend is, because there's lots of noise, right? Um, there's lots of noise in terms of where they are and the population numbers are going and exacerbated by the fact that there are very there are few long-term studies looking at that to kind of ascertain. Um, uh, so it's, on one hand, I think that's challenging. It's challenging to kind of say 
and I've put lots of caveats in the book definitively what's, what's happening in all places at once. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's encouraging because I think it shows us that if we just ease off insects a little bit, they can, they can bounce back. Um, one, one scientist I spoke to from the Netherlands said it's a bit like we've got our foot on a log that's in water, kind of submerging, submerging it. If you just take the foot off, they'll bounce back up. Um, climate change, I think, is the big worry for that because you know you can ban certain pesticides, you can protect areas, you can you know reform farming. Um, climate change is a, a longer, more intractable issue that we'll have to deal with kind of going forward. But um, yeah, certainly it's encouraging in some way. Yeah, sure. This belongs to the committee. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Thank you. I tried to steal something. I didn't get away with it. No. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Um, you haven't talked about insects as proper food because there's a lot of people, especially in Africa, who eat insects. And there's also... Um, people who produce, who reproduce insects as animal food, like dog food and so on. Yeah. Can you say something about that as future food? Yeah, well, I'm in the Bay Area, which is kind of feels like an epicenter for this. There seems to be every other startup is producing cricket um, protein bars. Um, <laughs> so uh, it feels like this is the right place to be talking about that. But yeah, I, it, one of the ironies of this could be that eating insects could help save them. Uh, the amount of energy and land and pollution involved in raising crickets to eat is far less than meat. I mean, uh, we will need to kind of cut down our meat consumption at some point if we're serious about tackling the tackling environmental challenges we face. Uh, and so reducing um, beef in particular, beef is by far the worst, um, uh, and, and phasing in insect eating would actually benefit insects because it would reduce a lot of the pressures on them. Uh, of course, you have to go over a huge cultural barrier by doing that. <laughs> like you say, in other cultures, um, it's very normal to be eating insects. Um, I kind of learned that there's huge warehouses they have in China where they raise cockroaches for soup. Uh, there's trillions of them just scurrying around. Um, and and they, there's, they've been found to have some medicinal qualities. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a cultural issue, isn't it? How we, how we get beyond that. I, there's no good. There's no easy answer how you encourage people to eat insects. <laughs> Maybe somebody has one, but I don't. Know. Thanks for great, this great talk. Um, in your book, you talk about the risks of flying blind or driving blind. The fact that we don't have for insects the same kind of high quality data that we have for birds or other groups. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if. Um, if through the, working on the book you have found examples of um, reasons to be optimistic, like either through, I don't know, people who realize that we need to be, you know, gathering data to understand long-term trends and variability, or maybe through the use of n new technologies, uh, remote sensing or uh, what have you, AI, yeah. Uh, to yeah, to try and understand trends. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think part of the this kind of wave of Kind of publicity around insect declines has certainly triggered many different research. I mean, I've heard about some of them tonight, even uh, new research efforts to, to, to gather more data. And I, I, I'd expect in a few years' time, we're going to see a whole range of studies coming out. Obviously, we don't have that long historical data. The, the amazing thing about that German study is that they had, they had that, and they had it in like type written files and on floppy disks and CDs and like they had to crunch all the numbers and it took some time to do that. But um, yeah, I think we're going to see more and more of that data coming out. I think one thing I would warn about that is it, it does worry me a little bit in terms of parallels with the climate crisis and the you know understanding now of you know climate change is is now so exact we can you know pinpoint exactly how much ice is melting Antarctica. We can attribute individual events now to, to climate change, how much climate change has worsened a wildfire season or a heat wave or whatever. Um, but the action to deal with that hasn't come at the same pace. You know, so there, there's that saying about, you know, counting the books while the library burns, right? We don't want to wait until we've got perfect information on the insect crisis before we act on it. I think we need to act on it with imperfect data. Hi, 
Uh, great book and great talk. Thank you. Thanks, um, so I, when I was reading your book, I was thinking about like the parallels with Silent Spring and that had such a big response that ended up, um, you know, getting DDT banned. And when I was, I was thinking, um, I mean, I think it's safe to say that everybody that's read your book or is here is on board in terms of, you know, <laughs> what we're bought in. Like, uh -huh. um, so I think in your mind, what is like the best case scenario in terms of like the public response? Like what, like, what do you want us to do? What happens next? Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'll just lay it out now. No, um, <laughs> we'll all go and do it. No, uh, it's a really good point because DDT, um, obviously, happen uh, sorry, uh, Sun Spring, very different time, different administration, different public response. Um, although Rachel Carson faced sexism and all kinds of nonsense, she she got through. She, I mean, she, Kennedy kind of loved her, um, and she, the the um, the the response was obvious with the DTT, and she she obviously had that kind of very evocative idea of you know spring being silenced, of bald eagles, you know national emblem being threatened i mean it was kind of quite an obvious kind of call to action wasn't it um insects are maybe less sympathetic in terms of people's way people view them but i think the upside is that the things that impact insects also impact us so you don't i mean there is a kind of good kind of save the bees movement you see now people dressing up as bees going to <laughs> process which is good but I think we can we can spearhead it with a message that these are things that are going to help us and they'll help insects, which also help us. So, you know, climate change, we're not going to do that. We're going to act on climate change for insects is to avoid our cities being drowned and burned down. We're, we're not going to act on habitat loss just for insects. It's from all the other, you know, charismatic creatures and other reasons we'd want to do that. Um, pesticide use, I mean, I think now we're finding neonics in human bodies, in human food, that's probably going to spur more action than if it was just wiping out insects. So uh, I think we've got to hitch our fate to theirs. I think that's probably going to be the way that we're going to do it. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. Actually, oh, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Did you have a follow-up? Well, all I was going to say is there are, in fact, some people under 30 in the room, some even under 20, and I'm going to hold the spot for a question from that group. So some of you start thinking now before I put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Again, th thanks so much for such a stimulating talk. I, I wish all of the policymakers in the world could could hear it. <laughs> Hope they will. But I was just wondering, uh, on the lines along the lines of of what positive things can we do? And I'm thinking a little further, what very visible positive things we can do? I was thinking, what what can you see as the roles of college and university campuses? in, for example, uh, improving habitat for insects. Have you, I presume you probably have visited a fair number in your speaking tours. Have you seen any great examples or, or what could you see as the future for these wonderful spaces, special spaces on our planet that are yeah. college and university campuses? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, because of, because of the, because Zoom is overtaking our world, I haven't been to as many as I'd like. Um, but certainly I know there are a few looking at the mixture of plants they have, native plants and so on. Um, raising awareness um, uh, amongst amongst students, I think it's fair to say climate change still dominates as a kind of rallying kind of issue. But um, I've I've had some good reaction from younger people towards towards that in terms of their on campus um, roles. So um, I think they can lead the way. I mean, obviously leading the way with research, but um, if you think more sympathetically about yeah what you're planting where, what, <laughs> how you're treating the grounds around you, I think is something that, you know, universities have led the way in so many of these, these kind of things in, in the past. I'm sure they can do it on this too. That's a perfect segue. Love to have a question from. You mentioned, you mentioned uh, communities planting milkweed uh, to sort of, provide habitats or a place for the monarchs to to stop in the US. Um, did that make a difference? And are there other things like that that we could do to help the insects? Yeah, I think it has made a difference. You've, you've had kind of volunteer groups do it for a while now, and now you're seeing cities across the US kind of signing up to it. So it's actual government, local governments doing it, which has been good to see. 
Um, some people also kind of breed and raise monarch butterflies at home and then kind of release them, which I think has gone less well um, because obviously they're not used to being in the wild. Um, but it kind of shows, it's encouraging because it shows that there's enthusiasm for an insect. You don't get much of that, do you? You don't get many people raising fleas at home to, to, to release them. So um, uh, I think it, it kind of points that there is kind of like some untapped affection for certain insects. Um, and if we can kind of broaden that somehow, then that would be a good thing. Sorry, I don't know if that would answer your question, but yeah, yeah, milkweed planting, good, yeah. I mean, all those other things we were talking about before, you can get behind and it'll help insects, which I'm sure, I'm sure you are all aware about climate change and the loss of forests and so on. Um, just above 20 myself, so I'm just gonna try to <laughs> slip in that. 26? Uh, well, 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 close enough. Okay. No. Um, I'm concerned about the term insect apocalypse, because I think back to the population bomb from the 1970s and, and all the uh, um, predictions made from that, and then they didn't take into account certain uh, technological advances, and people now look back and say, oh, Ehrlich, what are you talking? He, yeah. And so now we got insect apocalypse. Mm. And for those people who are not really tuned into the natural world, they're looking at this, ah, oh, here's another left winger out there saying, uh, the end is coming, and we've seen this before. So yeah. the problem is, how do you modulate the message? Because it is can be drastically important. Mm. But how do you come up, come out as saying, as not looking too radical so that the uh, centers, centrists and rightists, um, excuse me, um, can, can, uh, can get the message? Yeah, it's a good question. And I very deliberately didn't call the book The Insect Apocalypse or anything like that. I think crisis is, is enough. <laughs> you don't have to go more biblical. Um, there are others if you obviously use that term. And there's, I mean, that's a live debate in the climate activist community, like how much do you want to scare people? Like, does it turn people off or, or does it galvanise them? Uh, and I think, that's, I think it's an open debate. Really. I think it depends on the person, psychology of, of different people. But certainly if you feel that the world is doomed and there's nothing done about it, there's a certain helplessness there, isn't there? So I tried to kind of modulate the kind of the facts, which I think we will need to know of the clients with, with a sense that, you know, the solutions are within our grasp. We can actually do something on that. And it doesn't take that much, you know. And I mean, so many things are being politicised, haven't they? Hopefully insects won't be. Um, I can't see a bee becoming part of the cultural wars. Maybe they will. Um, but um, hopefully this is something that everybody can kind of get behind. People generally like bees and butterflies. I mean, it's not, they're not controversial. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully we can all get behind it. But the best way to do that is, is a good question. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So We do have a local spider expert who might say it's not going so well for some groups. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you. You talked a bit about the monarch habitat um, changing and they won't be able to stay there anymore. And then you've also talked about how we're creating a more beneficial habitat for mosquitoes and cockroaches. And I was just wondering about um, the, so there's the relationship between humans and insects, but then there are also insect to insect relationships. Right. And I was wondering if we're creating more and more habitats for um, certain types of bees, for example, could that potentially be detrimental if we're um, prioritizing some types of bees over others? Like if it's more widespread one kind of species versus native yeah. bees in an area or, or that sort of thing. Well, yeah, you're getting to really heart of conservation issues, aren't you? About how much do we intervene and what do we try and support and back and what do we don't? I mean, there's some people who'd be like, let's let pandas die out, they're pointless. I mean, they would have died anyway. They need bamboo, they can't even digest it properly. They're useless, just, just let, them, let them die. But obviously we have an affection for pandas. They look great. They're on the symbol of things, you know? Kids have stuffed toys with them. So the, the choices we make around conservation aren't logical or rational a lot of the times. They're kind of emotional, aren't they? Um, as much as anything, but you're right. I mean. I mean, I try and make it clear in the book there's kind of winners and losers. It's not 
every single insect is going to decline to nothing. You know, they, they are the great adapters. They kind of got through five mass extinctions. They will get through this one, just in an altered form and probably not beneficial for us. So um, uh, that's kind of my kind of thoughts on that. I mean, we, we certainly are creating more mosquito in, term, in terms of range because of climate change. The range is expanding a couple of years, a couple of miles a year, I think, the latest estimate away from the equator like expanding outwards because of the disease range so we can we can halt well slow that um and but i mean a lot of the actions around you know protecting habitat reducing chemical use acting on climate will benefit all kinds of animals and i think we can we can leave it to them to sort it out once we do that yeah um with the information that you've developed and the kind of feedback you're getting and the kind of questions that are coming out here. If you were to imagine your follow-up book to this um, scenario that you laid out for us, what are the kinds of things that you would be pushing? Because obviously you have a capacity as a journalist to do things that maybe researchers don't, are not willing to make, make jump off the ledge and, and make, make uh, movements on. If you were to make suggestions in your next book which I hope you're thinking yeah. about, what would they be? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I wrote this book in the depths of the pandemic in a really small apartment with two kids and a very neurotic dog who wants a lot of attention all the time. So I don't know if I want to recreate exactly that again. <laughs> but if I, if I um, were to say about the next book, I mean, I think the, chap the next chapter, not literal chapter, but metaphorical chapter on the insect crisis, I think is being written now because we're at the stage of like, Awareness rising, people kind of getting that there's a problem. People, some people trying to do s some things or push for change in certain areas, but obviously there's a whole heap of other issues that are overshadowing at the moment. I mean, just look in the last couple of years: the pandemic, Russia, Ukraine. You've got an election coming up next year. Do you think insects are going to be <laughs> debated? <laughs> I mean, I mean, we, there's always something else, isn't there? Um, I mean, even climate change struggles to get to. The top of the agenda so um, we're still in that early phase of awareness um, uh, in terms of in terms of things that could change though on that there are quick wins there I mean I've kind of mentioned it in the book but you could do more on it about how the EPA the USDA could more heavily regulate chemicals they could especially in even the national parks I mean that's an easy win that Obama tried and I think um, Trump reversed so um, I mean, there, there's some kind of things that can be done in the short term while you kind of gather that kind of broader momentum for change, for sure. Uh, great talk. Enjoyed it very much. Uh, I just want to address Paul really quickly that the, uh, the Essex Museum has led an effort to have the UC Berkeley campus designated a Xerxes Society B campus, which means we're minimizing uh, pesticide use on campus and promoting the planting of native plants. So that's an example of campuses standing up and, and doing what we, we hope they would do, <laughs> including creating a, um, a demonstration garden for, for pollination, thanks to folks like Gordon who have advised us on this. But my question to you, Oliver, so storytelling. So we, we dive deeply as academics into a topic, we get immersed in it, and we have our publications that we put out that five, 10, 15 other people will read. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we have a really deep knowledge of the topic, whereas as an environmental reporter and, and writer and journalist, you, you kind of move from topic to topic within a general realm. Mm. But uh, I'm interested in how, how you choose the project and, and how you approach it. But more importantly, what are the keys to being a good storyteller on, on a scientific topic like this? How do you, how do you translate what, what we do into something that people can digest and use in a practical way? Ooh, that's, a great, that's a great question. And it's kind of one I kind of grapple with every day. Um, I mean, I think your starting point is you, you do try to take a very subjective view as much as you can of what's important, like what's actually the big threat or the big problem or the big issue. And then you try to find ways to tell that story in a way that's engaging as possible. And that you, done through just like lots of interviews, like I, I spoke to hundreds of people for this book and just hours and hours and hours of conversations just um, and going through them afterwards. 
and you ask them all kinds of questions, like left field questions, a bit about their background. Like I spoke to one of the entomologist who was an art student, and she um, was became she was and she was doing pictures of these stoneflies because she found them beautiful. And then somebody else did a, a picture with like cat food or something, and her teacher loved the cat food thing and not the stonefly. She thought the stonefly was disgusting, um, and so she was she was horrified by this and quit and became an entomologist because she found it beautiful. She found insects beautiful. So it's like interesting, like little tidbits like that of like how people get into the, what motivates humans. I mean, ultimately we like reading about people, don't we, ourselves, and so we try to link that to a kind of human experience, I suppose. So it can be something like that, or it could be a kind of interesting data point that you can translate in a kind of interesting way that people can grasp in terms of the time frame or the scale of it. Um, there's multiple ways you can get into a story. It's a simple anecdote. I mean, the best writing, the New Yorker and New York Times do this very well, where they kind of talk, set the scene, like if they're on a research project with the researcher and they kind of talk about what they look like and the, the environment and you know the area they're walking through and all that kind of thing, you, you kind of paint a picture. So there's lots of different ways you could do it. Um, but um, th yeah, it's, it's, it just takes a lot of wading through lots of conversations <laughs> and going to lots of places. And sometimes something jumps out at you and go, like, okay, that's the, the lead for this. You know, I was in Salt Lake City recently to, to do a story on the shrinking of the Great Salt Lake. And, um, uh, and it was obvious what it was to start with. It's the threat of this huge dust cloud that's going to hit the city because um, the, the lake is drying up and it's whipping up all these toxins. I mean, that's obviously, it's like a huge, huge threat on the, um, to the city. It was, it was obvious what it was. But other things you have to really kind of search through for that little nugget that people can people can really enjoy. Great. We have at least two more questions. Maybe three, and that will get us close to the end. Dan. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to your next book with the uh, with the happy ending in it. Yeah. So to yeah. and so to to add some more material to what Pete mentioned. Um, in California, we have the beginning of some real some real success stories, um, and especially because we spent years educating our legislators, and we've got some good smart legislators. So Assemblymember Bauer Kahn has a couple bills that finally do some smart regulation of really key pesticides, AB 363 on uh, coated seeds. We, the state put up $10 million for a, a really ambitious um, specimen-based DNA-powered survey of California insects to, to literally save a specimen of everything. Um, Assembly member Lee right now has AB 38, which begins to regulate artificial lighting at night, which is a big impact. Mm. And so some of you may know about this, but not enough people do. And so um, I just want to put a call out for people to get involved so that we can be like those Bavarian agriculturalists <laughs> and seize the means of, uh, of, uh, of saving the bees and everything else. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. John. One comment you made, Oliver, uh, struck me with it was that um, farmers who are spending all this money on insecticides may not be getting a benefit from it. Yeah. And so I wonder who um, who could spread that message effectively because, um, I mean, we have farmers in, in the family and they, you know, there, there are two parts of that. One is, well, if it doesn't cost much, they'll do it. But if they're spending a lot and it's not providing something, they wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, the big ag has become so canny at getting itself in the conversation that they will sell now the seeds with the insecticides coated on it so if you're a farmer you can't in some cases you can't buy the seeds without having insecticides already embedded in it and then it grows throughout the plant as as the plant grows so systematic yeah so um so that's a problem i mean that maybe is only addressed through regulation i don't know but um Certainly you're seeing, and I spoke to farmers in the book who are looking at regenerative agriculture, doing things differently, moving back to a form of the kind of farm that I guess many of us think of farms as being, as being, you know, a family run operation with like some pigs there and an orchard there and maybe some crops over there. And most farms aren't like that now. They're kind of run as kind of arms of huge corporations with single monocultural crops um, uh, and all the destruction that involves. So. Um, there, there again, seeds have changed there, I, I feel, no pun intended, um, that are, are happening, but um, it needs to happen faster. Um, and I mean, if you speak to anybody in Washington, D.C., talk about the biggest, strongest lobbying groups, it's agricultural, 
corporations are extremely strong. They're very wealthy. They have a huge presence in DC. Um, how you break that, I, I'm not entirely sure. You also made a comment about bees playing soccer or football. Yeah. And I want to know if they have an agent, if they're in talks with Arsenal. <laughs> yeah. Messi's leaving PSG, maybe. So, yeah. I think the last question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, my, I already asked the question. Was there someone else? No, I was pointing at you, unless there's someone else here. No, go ahead. I think um, something you mentioned during the talk struck me that um, younger children aren't afraid of insects, but then as they get older, they become afraid. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit this in front of, of this room of people, but I'm an entomologist, and <laughs> there are definitely insects in the house that my husband kills for us. Um, okay. So, like, wow. but I think this something that I know, I know, <laughs> don't tell my advisor, but um, I think, like, <laughs> It's, I mean, it really seems like a lot of what you're talking about and a lot of the ways to get people on board and the reason that people aren't like necessarily like jumping on the opportunity to look for solutions is because of this emotional reaction that people have towards insects that is some comes along somewhere in our development. And um, like usually when I'm talking about what I do or trying to connect with people about like my research, if I'm like teaching a class or something, I've taken the approach that like it's okay to be afraid of bugs as long as you appreciate them and understand them. And but I'm thinking just from what you're talking about, maybe the approach should be the other way around. Maybe I should, you know, take more initiative to kind of get over my own like n feelings about the bugs that I'm not as enthusiastic about. <laughs> or um, yeah. maybe my approach should be to like. I'm, and I'm sure there's a lot of educators in the room too. Like, should our approach be to try to get people to get over those kinds of feelings or, yeah, because it, it sounds like, you know, even though this is like a scientific topic, it sounds like a lot of the implications and the way to get people on board are with this emotion, like this emotional reaction and this element to it. So what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I, I mean, we're all products of our environment, aren't we? So even you as an entomologist, you I mean, you can't avoid the system which you've come up through, right? Um, so I think it's hard to just break that to say to people, just love earwigs and love. You know. <laughs> you've got to love these. Um, you've got to love these these fruit flies. Um, it's very hard to kind of just tell people that, and people just go yes. Um, but I don't. I don't know if they necessarily need to have a huge love for them. Um, I mean, if you, I don't know if that translates to. Conservation. I mean, if you think of people love um, elephants and they love, I mean, elephants aren't doing great. I mean, people love tigers. There's 2,000 tigers left in the world. I mean, there's more tigers in Texas than there are in, world, in the wild in the world. It's incredible. So, like, love doesn't always translate to conservation action. It's the kind of bigger choices we make, I guess, around that affect them. And so that's why I feel if we make it kind of human centric, but looping in insects that maybe is more more profitable because we'll want to act on climate change and all those other pressures for other reasons than just insects do you know what I mean? one more question judy just pass it right to your left um no okay. yeah um D definitely the connection that you made at the beginning. Do you love chocolate? Do you love birds? Do you love food? <laughs> it's absolutely critical. There was a recent article in the Chronicle with Rita Moreno, and she was saying that there, she's noticed there used to be a dong chorus of birds that was so loud, and now you hardly hear them at all. And she said she went into the garden and she overturned a pot, and there's no you know, earwigs and roly-polies. She, she just saw this dearth and totally understood the connection between the insects and the birds. So, you know, people do see it, but I think so much more education needs to get done, you know, especially at the earliest levels and all the way up through. But, yeah. Yeah, and then joining those dots is tricky sometimes, isn't it? Like, yeah. you're not seeing certain birds around because there aren't, they don't have insects to, to eat. I mean, that's, that's tough, I mean. We, we, I think we, you've seen the last couple of years, it's hard for people to make connections between vaccines and masks and pandemics and like carbon emissions and climate change. Like how, uh, if we're struggling with those things, we're gonna struggle with insects. But um, 
I think there is a there are really kind of visceral reasons why we'd want to protect them. You know, people love chocolate. You know, so no brainer. <laughs> That's about as good an ending as you can get. Um, <laughs> so um, hold your applause for a moment because I want to run through a couple acknowledgments um, before we wrap up. First, I really want to acknowledge our incredibly reliable partners from ETS who um, show up for so many of our events. And yeah, we've seen you year after year. So thank you very much for being here. <laughs> um, uh, special thanks to Cassie Darling, events manager in the college, uh, for all the logistics and invitations and travel for Oliver and, and the event tonight. But in addition, Catherine and Linda, who are here from our team to staff the event, and anyone else who, um, just, am I missing anyone who's still here? Sunil left already, but, okay. Uh, and, and, yes, thank you. <laughs> and Julie's here. And Matt, our photographer, I think left a little while ago. So a special thanks to our team for organizing. Um, I'd love to see a show of hands of all who are ESSEG staff, researchers. Um, there you go. And then, and then even entomologists. <laughs> it's, yeah, what a, what a great gathering to bring together here. Um, so most of all, though, um, Oliver, I really want to thank you. I really want to come back to Pete's question. Um, you know, as without scientists, you would have no material. And without journalists, no one would hear us. <laughs> so it's a, it's a wonderful um, partnership in that way. And we're incredibly grateful for you uh, bringing to light all the research you did in this book and hope it does crack open a dialogue in the years ahead and, and some action on behalf of society. So thank you for coming tonight. Thanks so much, David. Thank you. Thank you.